talk and think a little bit about rediscovering the Word of God. And we're in 2 Kings chapter 23. You can follow along in your Bible or it will be on the screen here in just a second. As we, uh, as we look at this second chapter, second, the second letter or second book of Kings chapter 23, this is all about uh, King Josiah's reform, a revival that happened under the leadership of Josiah, the young or the boy king. Second Kings chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Then the king instructed Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second rank and the temple gatekeepers to remove from the Lord's temple all the articles that were used to worship Baal, Asherah, and all the powers of the heavens. The king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem on the terraces of the Kidron Valley, and he carried the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests who had been appointed by the previous kings of Judah, for they had offered sacrifices at the pagan shrines throughout Judah and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. They had also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun, the moon, the constellations, and to all the powers of the heavens. The king removed the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple and took it outside Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley, where he burned it. Then he ground the ashes of the pole to dust and threw the dust over the graves of the people. He also tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes that were inside the temple of the Lord, where the woman wove coverings for the Asherah pole. Josiah brought to Jerusalem all the priests who were living in other towns of, Ju of Judah, he also defiled the pagan shrines where they had offered sacrifices <coughs> all the way from Geba to Beersheba. He destroyed the shrines at the entrance to the gate of Joshua, the governor of Jerusalem. This gate was located to the left of the city gate as one enters the city. And then skipping down to verse 21. King Josiah then issued this order to all the people. You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Josiah also got rid of the mediums and psychics, the household gods, the idols, and every other kind of detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. He did this in obedience to the laws written in the scroll that Hilkiah the priest had found in the Lord's temple. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. The word of the Lord. What happens on October 31st? Thank you very much. Uh, that's usually our first response, isn't it? October 31st is a celebration of two different worlds. One is Halloween, something of a dichotomy between good and evil. It's uh, All Hallows' Eve in the Christian calendar, which is the start of a three-day celebration called All Hallow Tide. It's three days of remembering those who died in Christ. But which one gets the bigger billing in our culture? It's obviously Halloween, isn't it? It's uh, trick-or-treat and uh, taking home as much candy as you can stuff. Well, 
All Hallows Eve and All Hallow Tide and Halloween, these coincide together with many ancient traditions, mostly of, about harvest time, uh, but it includes the Gaelic or Celtic festival of Samhain. It's a time of thanksgiving for the harvest, and it's tied to some Christian practices or uh, themes or roots, but also some pagan roots. Hence, we have the remembering of the dead who died in Christ and are now alive and more alive than ever. And we also have the evil of witches and so on. Here's another October 31st celebration that gets very little billing, but it is a Christian theme, a Christian celebration, which is the opposite of the darkness of witches and evil. It's Reformation Day. It is the celebration of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses of, uh, to the church door at Wittenberg in Germany 503 years ago this year. So, five centuries ago, a man by the name of Martin Luther started something. Luther was a, a Catholic priest, and he recognized that the church of Jesus Christ that he dearly loved had slipped into the depths of hypocrisy. The church was courting the judgment of God, and he knew that he had to do something drastic. What was he to do? Well, Martin Luther did something very drastic. Very dangerous. You want to know what he did? He opened his Bible. And he laid it open. And he read it from cover to cover. For the millionth time, I guess, with Martin Luther. And then he took the list of rules that he was taught to follow as a priest, given to him by other priests and bishops, the Pope, if you will, and he laid the two side by side. And reading the rules given to him by men who led the church, and reading the Bible, the Word of God given to us by the Holy Spirit of God, <coughs> Martin Luther noticed that there are 95 ways, at least, where God's Word and the ways of men had parted company. I'm sure if he had worked more than a few months at this, he probably would have come up with 950,000 different ways. But what he did next was probably the most drastic and probably the most dangerous of all things. He sat down with Bible in one hand, rules of men in the other hand, and he began to write a paragraph about each place where the Word of God and the ways of men had parted company. These were 95 challenges. He took the papers that he wrote and nailed it to the wall. You see that on the screen. It's a good depiction of what it was like. If you see the look of concern on Martin Luther's face, it's a twofold thing. Number one, uh, Martin Luther loved the church. He was concerned for the church. He was concerned that the church returned to the things of God. But number two reason for concern was that what he was doing was so against what he was told to do by his bishop. What happened? Well, instead of a holy cleansing revival and renewal in the church, it started a riot. Luther was excommunicated from the church. He was removed from the church role, if you will and sent packing, and a rebellion followed. And the names flow in history, names we're familiar with, John Calvin, Martin Luther, later John Wesley, and a host of others led the way in trying to get the church blown apart in schism to come back together, but not in the unholy way they were before, but to come back together under the Word of God. Today, there are so many denominations. Actually, the, re the renewal failed. Um, it, it failed, and the church has been divided ever since. And some say that's a good thing. And to tell you the truth, there are some places to say that and be right about it. 
so many denominations in this day, it's hard to say just how many. And it's harder still to say which denomination, if any, truly holds the corner on the market of being right in all of its preponderance of doctrines and rules. But there is one safe thing to say about all the denominations and about all the different ways of thinking about how to do church, what parts of the moving parts of worship are right and which are uh, unholy, uh, whether we should do this, that, turn to the left, turn to the right, whatever it might be. There is one safe thing to say in all of the preaching, in all of the opinions, in all of the self-righteousness, in all of the wonderment and wishing. The one thing that's safe to say is that only God's Word holds the truth without mixture of any man's error. This is what is right. And anything that comes against this is dead wrong. Amen. Dead wrong. Martin Luther may have had King Josiah's reformation of the temple in Israel in mind when he began his efforts to try to turn God's people back to holy living and holy worship. Why do I say that? Well, think about young king, the boy king, Josiah. He was eight years old when the death of his father propelled him into the throne. He was king of Judah and Jerusalem. Later, 18 years later, when the text of 2 Kings chapter 23 takes place, he's 26 years of age, and there was some work being done on the temple. And uh, as anybody who has ever renovated an older house can attest to, when you break into an old wall, you're liable to find things in there that the original builders left in there. And that's what happened in the temple. <coughs> They found, as they broke through some of the walls, God's Word was hidden in the walls of the temple. It was the book of the covenant, probably the entire book of uh, Deuteronomy, but particularly Deuteronomy chapter 12. It was discovered, it was brought to the king, and it was read to him. And when Josiah heard the Word of God read out loud, it convicted his heart, much the same as 15 actually 28 centuries later, Martin Luther would have his heart convicted by the Word of God. Josiah, though, not only felt the conviction and the remorse in his own soul, in his own heart, Josiah changed his ways. Remember what I asked the children here this morning? I said, uh, is love all about the feelings in your heart? Or does it have something to do with what you do? Right? And what did they, intuitively, they knew that it was more than just those feelings in the heart. Love has everything to do with what you do. So Josiah not only felt remorse, Josiah changed his ways. I don't know if you heard the old story about George Washington. You remember what he used to do, chop down cherry trees all the time? And his father would call him and he'd say what? I cannot tell a lie. I, you know, I chopped down that cherry tree. I'm sorry. I have a picture in my mind of George Washington's father towering over him and looking at him and saying, George, I know, I know you're sorry, so when are you going to stop chopping down cherry trees? <laughs> it's not a matter of being sorry. It's not a matter of being convicted. It's not a matter of the feelings within. It's a matter of what we do with those feelings. Josiah understood that. What I want us to do with that in mind is to think about three things that Josiah not only felt deeply about, but did something important about. He did three things that were not easy, but were godly examples for us to follow in our lives, in our churches, and in our communities. The first thing that he did was he revealed God's Word to the people. The first thing Josiah did was reveal God's word to the people. Our text in verses 1 and 2 shows that when Josiah read God's word, he knew that all the people had no knowledge of how God had commanded them to live. Josiah's father and grandfathers had dabbled in witchcraft and pagan worship and secularism. They had forsaken Jehovah and they only had the title and the land. They didn't have the spirit of God. Now listen, this is this is rather important here. The, the king understood at 26 years of age what had happened. 
Frankly, I, I tried to put myself in Josiah's boots when I was thinking about this, putting, putting myself in the king's sandals, if it were. And you know what? He was 26 years of age. I can hardly remember when I was 26 years of age, but what I do remember when I was 26 years old is that I didn't have a clue about anything. I didn't, you know, I didn't have this wealth of wisdom. I don't have much more now, but the point is this, Josiah, the 26-year-old king, understood that what had happened here was that all of the priests and all of the high priests and all of the uh, established clerical rulers had stopped teaching the Word of God. He knew the people needed to know of their sinful ways, so he gathered them all together and he read the whole book of Deuteronomy. These people were astonished about it because the priests and the rulers had long since abandoned teaching it. Today, we have an entire generation growing up with no clear sound from the pulpits in America and around the world, reminding them of who they are and how they are expected to live. Because too many preachers have left off the preaching of God's word and gone to pop culture. He revealed God's word to the people. Secondly, Josiah did another thing. He removed the sinful practices that were afflicting the people. Josiah had the authority, and he used it to do some things. He removed the pagan altars. There was a lot more than just the altar of God inside the temple courtyard. There were pagan altars. There were Asherah poles, which were literally wooden poles set up with cloths over them, and they were seen as deities aside from God. What's commandment number one? I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And here they were with the Asherah poles and the pagan altars in God's own house in Jerusalem, the place where the Ark of the Covenant, a symbol of God's presence, dwelt, secreted away in the bank in the Holy of Holies, but out in the courtyard, Asherah poles everywhere, pagan altars everywhere. And he got rid of the heretical priests, those who wouldn't teach God's word. He got rid of the mediums, you know, a little bit of levitation here, a little bit of fortune telling there. He got rid of the prostitutes from the temple. You realize that in Josiah's day, the people had not heard the word of God, and so they didn't know that what they were doing, which is what their neighbors were doing, when they were worshiping, they were making use of male and female prostitutes inside the Lord's house. Josiah understood when he heard God's word spoken clearly that that was sinful. And he removed those sinful practices. And he not only did it in the Lord's house in Jerusalem, he did it from Geba, which is, if you look at the map, the northern border of Judah, he did it all the way down to Beersheba, the southern border. He was a clean sweep. Sin was not tolerated. I don't know if any of you actually saw the signboard out there, but uh, when it was my turn to take care of the signboard in chilly, chilly January, I stood out there and uh, uh, one of the quotes that I put on there by John Wesley was pretty simple. It says, when one what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. Direct quote from John Wesley. How did John Wesley know this? Because he read 2 Kings chapter 23. He knew that King Josiah was astonished when he heard God's word. He was astonished because he, the king, the one responsible for the glory of God to be held in revere in Jerusalem, in Judah, and in all of Israel, he knew it was not being upheld. And so he removed all of these sinful practices because he was not going to tolerate it any longer. Because as one generation tolerates it, the next generation will embrace it. Why do you think we are at the place we are at in this country? We have tolerated too long what is ungodly. 
and generation after generation, mine and yours included, have embraced what is ungodly. The third thing that Josiah did is he required, let me underline the word required, he required the people to seek renewal. That's strange to our Western ears, isn't it? About any one man requiring others to do things. Why is that so strange? It's because to us in the Western world, in America, particularly with all the freedom that we have, anything that says anybody else can tell me what to do, that's got to be wrong. Individualism, from John Wayne to Rambo, is do what you think is right. Well, the young king took a lesson out of Moses' book of the covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 12, and he required the people to remember who it was that saved them in the first place out of Egypt. What was that all about, to remember? He required they celebrate the Passover. That night when all Jews who are orthodox in their thinking and in their practice celebrate the sacred meal in memory of that night when the death angel swept over all of Egypt. You remember God's people were in captivity? And there they were, uh, slaves to another nation when truly God was their God, but they had sinned, brought into slavery. And that night when God was going to deliver them from that <coughs> slavery, how he did it was earth shattering was the last of the ten plagues, if you remember. That night, the death angel was going to sweep over Egypt and was going to take the firstborn of every household. There was going to be an exception, though, and God gave to Moses how the exception was to take place. The exception was that each Israelite household was instructed to kill a lamb, an unspotted lamb, an unblemished lamb, no imperfections, and take that lamb's blood and sprinkle the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels clearly so that as the death angel came over that act that singular act of obedience the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lintels that would say to the death angel this is an obedient household a household that reveres god And the death angel skipped over every one of those obedient homes. And the next day, Israel was free. <coughs> the next day, all of the Egyptian households that didn't believe and didn't cover their doorposts and lintels with blood were arranging for a funeral. You know, that lamb's blood has a great deal of implication for our salvation, doesn't it? How are we saved? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. Oh, precious is that flow. The young king offered his heart to God. He offered his life to God for the cause of helping others to know God. Let's recap what he did. First of all, he emptied the temple of every pagan vestige and practice. Secondly, he sent the lying priests, the clergy, packing. And thirdly, he burnt the Asher poles of pagan worship, and he banished the male and female prostitutes connected with such worship. This week in my reading, I read another preacher who talked about uh, the comparison between Josiah's time and Martin Luther's time, and what it has to do for our time. I want to read you what he wrote. He said, this much our time has in common with Luther's and Josiah's. The power is still powerful, dangerously powerful. And when the word gets out and the Holy Spirit gets hold of the word and the people who read it, powerful things happen. Walls come tumbling down. Stones can be rolled away. The heavens can be torn asunder. The powerful can be cast down from their thrones. The poor can be fed. The prisoners set free. Old wineskins can burst. Sinners can die to themselves and have Christ reborn in them. And churches, even old, dusty, mainline churches, can have new life breathed into them. This is the example of a frustrated priest named Martin Luther. When 
he was holding up for the clergy, for all the bishops, all the powers that be, right into Rome, and the Pope himself. And he was saying, what we've been doing goes against God's word. What did they say back to him? They said, you better take that back. Otherwise, we're going to fry you. We're going to burn you to death. Martin Luther said, and I quote directly, unless I am convinced by proofs from Scripture or by plain and clear reason and argument, I can and will not retract. I ain't taking it back. For it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. I have a very short sermon for you. These days, when denominations are confronted with God's Word, God's Holy Word, they usually rewrite their Bibles instead of their rule books. That's what the forebearers of Josiah and Martin Luther did. They rewrote their Bibles instead of changing their rules to agree with the Bible. Josiah and Martin Luther were different than that. They were willing not just to not rewrite their Bible. They were willing to turn the whole world upside down to agree with God and not man's new ideas. If there's one tried and true medicine for what ails the United Methodist Church, folks, look this way. This is important. Look up here, please. If there is one tried and true medicine for what ails the United Methodist Church and anything else on this planet, including you and me and this church and this denomination and this community, it is the wisdom of a 26-year-old king and a frustrated Catholic priest. Are you willing to hear it? This is what they told us. Thank you.